Welcome to this evening's Facebook Live with myself and, uh, and Alison Schofield, who I'll be introducing in a moment. Um, this evening's session is debridement, a key aspect of wound care. As I said, with Alison Schofield, who's a tissue viability team lead and clinical nurse from North Lincolnshire and Gaul. Uh, good evening, Alison. How are you? Hi, Alec. Yes, I'm uh, pretty good. Thank you very much. Um, really glad to be presenting this evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm, I'm measuring the, the amount of Facebook Lives that we're doing on the length of my hair, because the hairdressers obviously aren't open. <laughs> and um, so um, you'll be able to see the differences as we go along. But, um, but yeah, yeah, quite good, obviously, at home uh, today, as you are too. So... Um, I, I understand in Wales you've got some storms brewing, so um, it's uh, we quite do. Mild. Yeah, yeah. We do. I, I was actually just going to say one of the things that uh, we just we've been saying for the last uh, few months since we've been doing these remotely is just to. You'll obviously see that we're doing these from our houses, so be uh, be aware that if there are any technical issues, um, we will come straight back. But this evening in particular, because certainly where I am I'm just looking out of my window and there's a huge thunderstorm we've had lots of thunder over the last hour I think my internet should be fine but you can handle it if I do drop off in fact there's a, a gigantic gray cloud that looks just like a squirrel outside of my window at the moment which is uh, I'm hoping not going to cause us any issues but if it does then uh, if everybody could just bear with us um, with regard to this evening's presentation, we will have a live Q&A towards uh, at the end of the presentation. So please make sure that throughout you're asking lots of questions uh, in the comments section or you can send them in direct to us. Myself and Alison will then go through a live Q&A with you at the end. Um, I just want to thank Essity at this point for supporting this event. Uh, this is They've supported many of these events. They are our first sponsor for Facebook Lives and we'll uh, forever be grateful for that. Um, certificates will be available at the end. A link will be shown um, where you can download them. Um, I've mentioned technical issues. Uh, I, I'm, you threw me a bit right at the beginning, Al. I don't know whether you could tell, but you threw me because you started talking just as I was Sorry. about to. So I'm just going to admit that so that when I get off camera, I can compose myself and start again. So um, I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you uh, for debridement, a key aspect of wound care. And I'll see you after the presentation. OK, thanks, Alex. Sorry about that. Yeah, I missed the uh, the countdown a little bit there. So um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, thank you again for giving up your time and watching um, this evening, wherever you may be, um, whether you're in the storm like in Wales or you've got great weather like we have in Yorkshire. You may be sat, um, you know, outside in the garden. You may be, you know, in the in the sat in the in the living room with a cup of tea, glass of wine, whatever. But we we thank you and we love the 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 JCN community that that join us here. And I just want to give a shout out to Susie TVN from the Christie. I know you're watching because you told me and you sent me an email today, and I will get back to you tomorrow and any of you in our community have sent me messages um, or emails about things and um, if I haven't responded yet please do um, remind me and as I do at the end um, if we can't answer all your questions I will in the next two days go through the presentation again and I will personally answer individually to to you um, all the all the questions that you have and if I don't know the answer then I will seek to find out that information. So for this evening um, we are going to be looking at um, aspects of debridement in wound care um, and I think this is a really great topic that all of us um, who work within wound care in some, some shape or form are really interested in. So the key learning outcomes for today will be to understand the importance of debridement in wound care to identify the clinical appearance of that devitalized non-viable tissue, to clarify some of the sometimes confusing terminology around this, and to understand why, when, and how, and who can debride in a primary community care situation, and to know how debridement can accelerate wound healing and improve the patient's quality of life. And we want to be aware of the role of mechanical debridement and, that it's, and its relevance in primary community care. So the ability to undertake a holistic assessment and identify barriers to wound healing is a really important skill to have. 
So one barrier to wound healing is the presence of dead devitalized tissue. So that appears on the surface of the wound. So we need to remove, remove this, and that's considered to be a cornerstone of wound management. So we must always consider the removal of dead skin as well. So, um, so the skin care regimes are so important. And if that um, dead dry skin builds in any way, shape or form, um, then we can have a buildup of hyperkeratosis, which is that thick, dry um, skin issue um, that we see sometimes in lower limb conditions. And so this is a really good example of where patient self-care um, and self-supported management um, can, can be presented and involved in that care planning. So let's look at um, some clinical appearances of wounds. So we, you can see you've got a photograph there of a um, wound to a heel. So in the, um, the bottom and the centre of the wound, we've got some black necrotic and um, eschar material. Um, and then to the top of the wound, we've got yellow, softer material. So what's happening is that necrosis has become softer. Um, and there's so that so we, we that now we've got that slough at the very edge of the wound. We've got a red peri wound area. It's not infection. It's not that spreading infection that we see two centimeters plus from the edge of the wound, but it is an, an inflama inflammation um, area. Um, and we've also got some uh, a bit of um, dry skin there. So we've got some remnants of a previous blister. So this could have been originally um, a blister to the heel. It could have been a category two pressure ulcer. Um, it could have been a um, deep filled, um, a deep tissue injury, a blood filled blister um, pressure ulcer. Um, so, um, so, but we, we can see now that's evolved and we have um, devitalized tissue to the center of this wound. So if you think in practice, if you saw this, you know, how would you address this? How would you um, um, manage this in practice? What care pathway would you be putting into place? So if we look at the next wound that you can see, um, so this wound has a um, areas of granulation in the center. Can I just explain to you that this wound has been a, an amputation. This patient is diabetic on insulin and they have developed a diabetic foot also. And this, um, because sometimes in diabetes, the microcirculation to the feet and the nerves can be affected. So if a wound is developed, then we must refer immediately to our diabetic foot team, vascular teams, because it may need that they need surgical intervention. And in this case, the patient has needed an amputation of that, of that toe. So in the, 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 the surgical wound that's remaining, there are some slight areas of granulation tissue in the center that you can see there. There is a lot of soft yellow slough and some of it is, you know, it's, it's quite viscous slough. Um, and then on the underneath of the, the part of the foot there, we can see there's some areas of that harder black necrotic tissue. And it's possible that the toe had that appearance initially and that's why then it was amputation because you can't bring that back again to normal tissue. We can see on part of the foot there, there's remaining sutures from the surgery too. And on the, on the top of the foot, there is some dry skin and some stubborn hyperkeratosis on the foot. So hyperkeratosis means um, uh, um, an excess of keratin production, which is skin. Um, so it just overproduces. So we use a, a number of um, term of different terms interchangeably around debridement. So debridement um, means to remove constraints. Um, there's a definition which is the removal of adherent, dead, or contaminated tissue. Um, and this was produced by a chap called Robert Strohull. Um, and he's a leading dermatologist who I believe is based somewhere um, in Germany, Frankfurt, I think. Also, um, we look at wound bed preparation. So we look at, um, at a framework for that and a really good one is the TIMES framework. So this looks at all the aspects of the wound. So we're looking at the tissue type, any infection or inflammation, the moisture levels in the wound, we need to have a moisture balance the edges of the wound and also that surrounding skin. So this is looking at the wound as a whole, not just the type of tissue in the wound bed. 
So when we think about wound cleansing, so that is the removal of dirt, any loose metabolic waste or foreign materials. And that could even be old dressings um, that have, have been, you know, remnants that left left within the wound. So we use types of fluids to gently remove loosely adherent contaminants and devitalized materials from the surface of the wound. So this could be water and there is lots of um, information and evidence around the use of tap water in chronic wound cleansing. That's absolutely fine. It may be that you use types of um, solutions like PHMB solutions um, or acute wounds. We often use saline and you may use those in practice. So follow your local guidelines within that. So why should we debride? Well, the presence of dead and devitalized tissue on the wound um, hinders wound healing. I mean, the, the word tissue viability and our tissue viability services is about the tissue being viable. And when we have, um, you know, sloth and necrosis and a wound is slow to heal, then the, the wound is not viable. So it's a physical barrier to, barrier to wound healing because we know when a wound heals, we want that lovely red granulation tissue, the epithelial cells contract together and they leapfrog over, over each other in that lovely moist um, environment that we provide. Um, so this um, acts as a barrier to that happening. And bacteria love nothing more to, um, to breed and grow in dead devitalized tissue. It can also mask and mimic infection too. Um, so we, we, we have to look at the infection continuum scale from a colonized wound to a locally infected wound and then spreading infection. Um, so if a wound is, if we can't see the wound bed and it's covered in discolored slough, for example, then we, we may think, oh, this wound is infection, but it may be just that the wound is colonized. So we then, we, we do get increased rest, risk of infection because of the wound, of the bacteria breeding in this environment. And also malodor, because if you've got lots of that slough there and it's starting to come away, um, then the wound can become very mal malodorous. Um, and can be a, an effect to the patient's quality of life. It can reduce the effectiveness of topical preparations because it's a barrier. Um, biofilms, um, bacteria, um, we, you know, we, we, we're trying to aid the wound healing. So we're using particular products. We know the body heals a wound, but the products will, will en enable and enhance that wound healing. Um, so this can stop those um, um, topical preparations penetrating. Because we've got so much sloth and things there, it can also increase the amount of exudate too. Um, so, and it can hinder the wound assessment. So if you think about types of wounds like pressure ulcers, so um, we know if we've got a pressure ulcer that's covered in slough or necrosis, we call it an unstageable pressure ulcer, don't we? But we can't actually fully assess it because we don't know what the wound is. We know it's going to be a category three or four. Um, so with many wound types, we need to be able to see that wound bed to properly assess if there's any bone exposure, undermining, tunneling and things like that. So debridement then comes into play. So that we, we've, we've established the presence of devitalized tissue is known to facilitate infection. So the debridement processes remove any bacteria and they can disrupt, disrupt biofilm. Now, biofilm, um, it's, you know, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because we, we can't always see it. We know it's there. Sometimes it's described as like a shiny film on the, on the wound bed. But I think the best um, indication is that the wound is, has become hard to heal. Um, that it's become sort of stuck in that inflammatory process and there's something happening there that you know that it just won't progress any further um, so and it's like a force field if you, you'd like an umbrella or a, a you know a real force field over the top so we need to penetrate into that to get through the bifill because it, it kind of attaches itself to the wound bed um, and it, it's really difficult to to remove so debridement is an essential step in that to facilitate um, any healing.
So when we are developing our wound care pathways, biofilm um, management and debridement should be incorporated into that. I have in my trust, we have an infection prevention pathway. Um, it's for prophylaxis and also management of infection bacteria. And we involve mechanical debridement in all stages of this. So failure to progress in any wound following, you know, we could have had anti, um, antimicrobial treatment there. We could have even had antibiotic um, treatment, but still the wound is delayed. And can I just mention with antibiotic treatment that we have an anti um, antimicrobial stewardship. So we don't want to have an overuse of um, antibiotics. We don't want people to become um, you know, un, un, to become resistant to antibiotic treatment and certain antimicrobials. So when we are swabbing of wounds, please be aware of the infection continuum. And when a wound is colonized, spreading, in, if it becomes spreading infection, then we need to be swabbing because that will indicate to us the type of antibiotic that is needed at the time. So we can have recurrence of delayed healing after all these types of treatment. And despite optimal treatment that we see, and we have, we follow in our pathways and we, you know, we've still got some delays in wound healing. Biofilms are really tricky um, to, to manage. So the clinical signs of them is an increasing exudate. We can have chronic inflammation of the wound area. We can have that erythema, so that's redness and heat and it's spreading to the wound edge and then um, outer um, from the wound to the surrounding skin. And also the granulation tissue could be a really poor color. Granulation tissue, we want to be that deep red, you know, good, healthy color. Um, and if it's a pale color, often it's because there's not, a, there's not a very good blood supply to the area. But if it's over granulated, so those capillary loops have kept going, you know, it's over, um, it's, it's above, the edges of the, of, of the wound and it's friable. So that means it's uh, prone to bleeding. So on cleansing, dressing removals, then we get that bleeding. Often that's a sign of, of biofilm within there. So we need to address this. So if we look at the pathway, so we've got a static, static chronic wound. So we're suspecting a biofilm. So we want to reduce the biofilm. Debridement is our, our choice of um, management, vigorous cleaning. And this is proven to be really effective. So we'll call this mechanical debridement and we'll look at that in more detail shortly. So we want to prevent recontamination. So we want to look at topical antimicrobials. And again, these come in various forms. So look to your local formularies. There are antimicrobials which will deposit and donate particular things like silver. Um, there's honey, which works on, on osmosis. And there are also dressings which are bacteria binding. So they will remove bacteria without donating anything into the wound and the body. We want to then suppress biofilm reformation. And so we repeat the debridement process and we keep reassessing all the time. So it is a cycle of care. So our targets for, for debridement are to remove necrotic, devitalized tissue and any sloughy tissue that is there. Slough forms as part of um, a wound process. I mean, when, when wounds are healing, you know, we get that inflammation process and everything starts happening. We get the workmen coming along and we get the, I always call it the Pac-Men, the, um, the macrophages who come along and they're kind of eating up all the, um, all the elements of, uh, of, of cells that shouldn't be there. They're doing the sweeping out and the cleaning process. But if, if people have got risk factors and a, and, and a wound becomes chronic, then that sloughy tissue can start to build and grow. So it's, we need to remove the sources of infection for this and the sources of that inflama inflammatic process. So we want to remove any exudate and also dried exudate because that slough isn't always wet, is it? Sometimes it become, can, can be dry and hard and then that dry skin and then that hyperkeratosis build up. Some wounds can be leaking and pus, um, so we want to remove that. And hematomas, I mean, um, you know, you see, we see skin tears, we see um, a knocks to the leg where a hematoma then can become present. So this is um, deposits of blood 
that that um, form under the skin. Now, if we just leave them there, then they're going to become, um, you know, they, 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 they will break down the tissue anyway, and we can get infection forming, so we need to remove them. And depending on the, um, the, the severity of this, because some of them may need to be referred on and some of them need surgical debridement, and I've seen some needing plastic surgery repair too. But ultimately, we need to ensure that that hematoma is removed because it's not going to repair itself or do anything. So any debris, foreign bodies in the room can be removed by debridement. So, you know, even some dressings, you know, can leave remnants in, in there. It's not ideal, um, but, you know, with the cleansing and debridement processes, then we can ensure that they will be removed and not causing any problems down the line. And any other barriers to wound healing that may be occurring. So our targets for debridement are to decrease the odour, which obviously has a massive impact on the quality of life. You know, we, we have a patient um, and we have a patient story. And if you have YouTube access, go on TVN Together, a digital. We have a patient story on there. It's a patient of mine and she's called Diane. And she lived with a chronic pressure ulcer for many years. And now, thankfully, it is healed with great care and attention. Um, but when, when her main aspect um, for her quality of life was the odour, because when she had family or friends visiting, she said she knew that odour was there and she felt ashamed. Um, so, you know, it might be that uh, wound healing is not always the goal for the patient. It's the management. So this debridement process is a really a, a important aspect of that. So we want to... Um, decrease the excess moisture that's coming off from the slough and reduce the infection and then that stimulates because we've got that beautiful red you know granulation tissue as it should be and then it's um, encouraging those epithelial cells to come together and contract which um, causes the wound to close so when and how often should we debride? When, when is it safe to do so? So the earlier we do debride will accelerate the healing and frequent debridement will have better healing outcomes. We know there's evidence around this. But when should and when not should we debride, um, and which is very important. Um, so if somebody has peripheral arterial disease, if they have um, toes um, that are black, necrotic, necrotic areas to the foot, um, you know, gangrenous, you know, should we be debriding at this point or not? If there's high risk areas to the body, hands, feet or face, which the skin is extremely fragile, the thinnest part of your skin is on your eyelids, the thickest part is on the soles of the feet and the palms of your hands. Um, but, you know, should we be debriding um, on the top of the hands and places like that? The older we get, we lose collagen and elasticity um, within our skin. So our skin becomes very fragile and thin. So we have to be careful in areas where we are debriding. What about proximity to blood vessels, any nerves or tendons too? So this could cause a lot of trauma and pain. Now, if you think about patients with fungating wounds, you know, they are very vascular and prone to bleeding. And I'm going to make your toes curl now because um, I was um, asked once in practice about somebody using a debridement pad on, on a patient who had a vulval and fungating tumour. Um, and obviously these these you know tumors they they are very mal odorous they have um, slough covering them etc cetera, etc cetera. you know but we would never in a million years take a debridement pad or something um, to to cleanse you know this type of wound because it could cause a severe bleed and um, trauma to the patient blood clotting disorders as well if somebody's um you know on warfarin or they have a clotting disorder which makes them prone to bleeding again if we if we are debriding we have to be very careful and aware the type of debridement we are using because we and, and the setting because it can cause um, a bleed and inflammatory conditions so a, one particular condition which is related to leg ulceration is pyoderma gangrenosum so we we could actually inflame 
um, this by using mechanical debridement. So anything to the, I want to say to below the knee, a lower limb wound, leg, foot, always make sure you do a lower limb assessment, including a Doppler to ascertain the ABPI before even considering any type of debridement. And remember, we work as an MDT, podiatry, vascular, specialist nurses, all of us together to make the decisions. So how do we debride? So the debridement, debridement method should be based on the needs of the patient and not the skills or what we are familiar with as a nurse. So debri debridement was, must um, follow a full holistic assessment. We always, obviously, in everything that we do in, in uh, clinical care, has to have a full holistic assessment and that of the patient and in wound care of the wound too. So remember that times framework. So let's look at um, a framework of a holistic assessment. And this is case, and it's really good is case because um, it, it follows the, so we're looking at the cause. And I always say to everybody, put your Sherlock Holmes hat on. Um, let's look at the cause of the wound, whatever the wound may be, how has that wound been caused? Because sometimes we take the cause away, we can prevent that from happening or it aids in our management processes. So we're looking at the cause and then we're gonna assess fully the patient and the wound. Then this will form our care planning so we can then select the delivery of our care and this will involve the debridement process and then we evaluate. So it's a continuous cycle of care. So what method of debridement should we choose? And this can be based on, on, on different aspects. So it depends on the nature of the tissue type where on the body the, um, the, the wound is. Remember, we talked about the face, the back of the hands, fragile areas. It can depend on the size of the wound as well. You know, is it practical to be able to do this? And the speed of debridement required because the debridement processes can be very different. And what do we need, why and, and, and when? So there are different factors we should base debridement on. So the patient factors we must look at are what level of pain is the patient in and what level of pain are different debridement processes going to cause to the patient. So if nerves are exposed, you know, some wounds, most wounds, to be honest, aren't they, are really, really painful to the patient. And we have to acknowledge that. And we need to make sure we've got good analgesia processes in place. That's working with um, our G GPs if we're in community practice or in acute practice with our, our um, you know, doctors and consultants, because um, some patients may need to take that before we are going in to do any type of um, intervention. The environment the patient's in, because there are particular types of debridement, which we'll talk about in a moment, which are just not suitable for some settings. Some are in clinical and very specialist settings, and some we can perform in patients' own home or in community type clinics. We need to have the consent of the patient and obviously their choice as well. So it's about informing the patient about all the what we're going to do and that, that they will, they, you know, they, they have to decide on any intervention that we're doing. So we include them. They're always at the heart of the process. The age of the patient, any comorbidities, and I'm not just talking about the older adult here, because obviously, you know, the, we know, as we've just said about the older person's skin and things like that, and it might come along with lots of comorbidities. But, you know, what if it's a patient who is, um, you know, a child, paediatric care, learning disability care, you know, we have to think about all that holistic management around that. How are we going to perform this? So all those aspects that will affect the patient's quality of life. And then we have to think about the clinicians. So what level of skill have the clinicians got to perform um, levels of debridement? The resources available. So my formulary may be very different to your formulary. So we could have different um, dressing uh, products within there. And of the other debridement um, resources we have, you know, is that available within your own trusts and practices? So we must always follow our own organisation policy and our own organisation's guidelines. 
So with the patient, we have to involve them in all the decisions. I can't stress that enough. So we have to get that informed consent. So that can be expressed, implied, written or verbal. But importantly, we must explain all processes and what is going to happen. Um, and, you know, be, don't be. We, we must involve patients more in, in wound care, like we do in other aspects of chronic wound, of chronic, sorry, chronic disease management, like diabetes, asthma. So a lot of patients want to be involved in this process. So let's explain to them what is happening, why it's happening, you know, and, and how possibly they can be involved in this as well. So we want to give them suitable information so they are, an, an, are an able to make a decision. And are they capable to make the decision? You know, let's think about um, mental capacity. Some of our patients have dementia, Alzheimer's, um, or other, um, you know, comorbidities which will um, enable um, them to, you know, disable them to, to have capacity. Somebody, as I said today in a training session to some carers in a care home, somebody may be able to consent to the fact that they want a cup of tea, but may not be able to consent to other deeper processes so we have to take that into account and do we need to then involve family members carers um, if it's a, a child or somebody with learning disabilities a parent or guardian for example too so let's look at the methods of debridement so we first of all we have autolytic debridement now this is a natural process within the body so you know i talked about before about the pacmen coming along in that cellular process of that inflammatory wound healing and they're coming along then with their sweeping brushes or they're eating up all the um, the debris and stuff like that so that's what's happening so our own body's enzymes then break down any necrosis or slough that's occurring but it can be quite a slow process so we can aid this along too. So we can apply um, products, wound products to soften this down and break it down. So when you think about from your formularies, we might use um, like hydrogels, um, the hydrocolloids or hydrofiber. Um, so that, you know, making the wound, adding moisture to the wound, basically. So to soften all this down and then and then remove it. And you'd have a secondary dressing over the top of that. So it's suitable for most types of devitalized tissue, to be honest. But if a wound's got a lot of exudate, high exudate, it might not be suitable because if we're adding more moisture into it, then the surrounding skin can become affected. We might not be able to manage those levels of exudate. It is something though that could be suitable for a supported self-management. So if we're, if we're deriving um, pathways with our patients so they are involved in their care, and I've done so many of these on all different wound types, it is doable and acceptable. Um, and patients can use um, types of dressings and types of, um, of, of different types of debridement um, to support this. Sometimes it's used as an overuse method because we are very familiar with it. Um, you know, it's a kind of easy go to. Well, we'll use that product because, you know, that's what we use to de-slough a wound type thing. Um, but it, it is relatively pain free and it's an easy accessible. You know, we can prescribe them or we might have them on our, you know, whichever route you obtain your, your stocks and, and stores from. Um, and as I said, you know, suitable for um, carers or patients themselves, families to, to apply to. So we move on now to we can also use mechanical debridement. So mechanical debridement is the use of monofilament pad or debridement cloths that um, contain a surfactant. So this type of uh, mechanical debridement um, can help to remove bacteria and biofilm. And there's a lot of really good evidence around this, that this really disrupts, especially that biofilm. Remember that force field um, that it can break into that. So then we, you know, then the, the treatments we're using can penetrate in, into the wound where we need to. Um, it, it's suitable, suitable often for a more the, a, a, a slough that softening, a very hard necrotic tissue. It would be hard to penetrate, but if that if that slough uh, that necrosis is starting to soften, then um, we you know we might be able to, um, to to get through to that. 
It's a rapid debridement, so it's suitable for patients um, to use themselves or, or carers, quite easy to use. Um, and in the past, there used to be um, th this type of mechanical debridement used to be called wet to dry gauze. We don't use this anymore because it was literally gauze was put onto the wound. It was wet, it dried out and then it was removed. So it's kind of like it kind of stripped um, whatever was on the wound bed away from there. And obviously that was very painful and traumatic to the, to the, the patient and the patient's wound. So we, we, we really don't want well, we've moved on greatly from those sorts of uh, of uh, old fashioned uh, methods. We also have larval therapy. Now, if any of you have, have used this or come across it, you know, it's a fantastic form of debridement. They're like, I've been to the um, larval, the Biomon factory in Wales, and it's fantastic and fascinating. And it's often referred to as biosurgical debridement. So it uses the sterile larva of the green bottle fly. So they have a colony that they breed and keep growing. And it's a form of autolytic debridement, like we've just described in the dressing processes. So what the larvae does, it produces an enzyme. So it, it, um, it, it produces that, that liquefies the, the, you know, the, the, the sloughy tissue, and then they ingest it. Um, and then they produce a type of um, apparently an antibiotic, which also goes on to help with the wound healing. So it's quite a rapid debridement. Um, it's, it's not for everybody because a lot of patients just don't like the idea of it and won't accept it. And even some healthcare professionals I've come across don't like the idea of it and don't accept it. Um, but and, and, and also I found in community practice, which is where I predominantly work, we have a barrier from primary care with because you have to be an independent or prescriber. So like a GP, basically, it's classed as a medication. Um, so they, they're reluctant to sometimes do it because it is quite expensive, really, too. Um, you know, and that, that you might need several courses of treatment for it to work, but it is there, and you know, it is it is a fascinating um, um, form of debridement to look into. So we have some specialist types of debridement too, and they would obviously need a specialist referral. So we have ultrasonic. So this is directly on the wound bed or by an atomized solution, and I have to confess, this is something I haven't seen in practice. We have hydrosurgical. So this uses a high energy saline beam as a cutting implement. And I have seen this and I have used this, but in a, in a lab um, situation and, um, and using not real skin, but false skin. And this could take your fingers off. So obviously things like this would not be used in somebody's home, wouldn't be used in a community clinic, would be in a very specialized setting. There is sharp debridement too. So this uses scalpel or scissors or a curette to remove um, devitalized tissue. Um, and sometimes we use this in con conjunction with other like the autolytic debridement and mechanical debridement methods. Now, again, this is something you have to have a course in. You have to be trained and have a certificate to do that. It's something that I have done. So it wouldn't be undertaken lightly. And a lot of podiatry teams um, do perform this type of um, sharp debridement. There is surgical debridement as well. So this would be where a patient is referred into your specialist um, acute services. So it'd be undertaken in like an operating theatre environment. Um, so they would um, need to have that removed. And sometimes this then involves plastic surgery repair to the tissue. So every practitioner really has a duty of care to provide some element of debridement. And, and if you think of, you know, look at what we've just talked about, I'm sure, you know, you as healthcare professionals can, you know, think of some, you know, some of you will be more qualified in some areas than others, but we will all have some aspect where we can be involved in that to deliver in a timely, safe and appropriate manner. So it's really important to know when to refer to a specialist, and, and to the best qualified person to debride. So not debriding or referring can potentially cause harm to the patients as well. So it's all about that multidisciplinary working and, um, and, and, and you know, who's relevant um, within that patient's aspect of care. So now I just want to introduce you to a brand new product and this is called Cutimed Debris Clean. So um, if you can see on my screen, I have one here. 
Okay, so this is a cutie med debris clean. So now I'm just going to, um, we're going to move on to a short video that I, I have done, and it shows you the process of the cutie med debris clean and, and how it's used um, within practice. So what I've got here is our lovely little monofilament pad. Okay, so it's called debris clean. And the great thing about this is it's got a little um, hand holder at the back there. So we just put our hand into it like so. And then we've got uh, our little cleansing pad. Now we've got this and it's really soft and fluffy. And um, so this is a... Um, we can use this all over the skin if we want, and we can use it on the wound. And then this part here, um, which has got the blue stripes, can be used on more stubborn areas, so such as the hyperkeratosis, the thick, dry skin. And also, do you remember we had the other wound we did for demonstration at the bottom, and it's got the necrosis in it, and it's a softening necrosis, is this, but it's still you know, a bit hard and stubborn. So we can use that um, to um, try and remove some of that area there too. Um, but everything we do, we do obviously with, uh, with, with guidance on our local policies. So um, I'm going to use this to show you. So how you use this is just in a gentle circular movement. So the pad is really soft. It's not something that is designed to be painful for patients. So if you just reassure patients as we're going through, um, and there's no time limit to it, you know, you can take your time. Um, and we can remove, so you can see there now some of that yellow slough there um, has removed with the, with the pad. And if we can have a go at some of the thick hyperkeratosis here, you might need to spend a little bit of time and attention um, with these sorts of areas, but some of these flakes are lifting away. Seeing how practically we can use the Cutie Med Debris Clean. So this is a brand new product and it's going to be available on drug tariffs for you to, um, to access from the 1st of July. Um, so it, as, you, as you saw, it's a gentle loot monofilament fibres on the white aspect and then we've got more abrasive on the blue. So um, it, the pad can absorb bacteria and so we can tackle any real viscous slough and softening necrosis too there. Um, and and we, we, everybody always asks us about price of products, so the price is there um, for you to see. So it's an, 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 a safe and effective debridement product um, and the studies that have already been done with this um, show that there's above 99% biofilm removal with just four wipes of this. So it's got a, a strong cleaning um, efficiency and it has that bacterial binding as monofilament pads do. So um, the bacteria and debris um, adhere to it and then they um, remove within that cleansing process. So mechanical debridement is really is a good effective process to tackle um, um, biofilm and um, any um, microorganisms that are there within wounds. So just in conclusion, the presence of dead devitalized tissue on the wound bed hinders the wound healing. So it makes debridement an essential step to facilitating the healing process. So debridement follows holistic patient and wound assessment and the method chosen should be based on the need of the patient, not always just the skills and what we are familiar with as nurses. So remember to refer on if we need more specialist type of debridement. So there are several methods suitable within primary community type care and obviously in acute care too. But mechanical debridement, it's a quick option. It's a gentle option and it's suitable for those, you know, supported self-management process that we've seen occurring more and more because of the situation with COVID-19. Um, but, you know, we, we will add continue this advancement within wound care we need to make more of a partnership with our patients and carers with that as we do with other chronic disease management so there are some res re um, useful resources out there and just on screen now there's some uh, publications which are around debridement and also about the um, the times framework um, wound assessment that you can access freely 
And if you're interested in looking further into the, the product that we've talked about and was on the video, the Cutimed Debris Clean, then you can contact ESET um, for more information and support around that too. So now I think I've talked enough and I'm going to hand back to Alec and I hope that you've um, put some questions forward that you know we can answer. And as I said, if we can't answer everything, obviously at the moment, then I'm, I'll go back in the next couple of days and we will certainly um, um, answer all the questions that, that, that you've posed tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really interesting, uh, interesting presentation. Um, so we've had loads of questions and lots of uh, lots of comments throughout, but one from me to start with. Um, so one of the things I always find quite interesting about, about debridement, and maybe this is a really daft question, but why do we debride wounds um, if we're told not to pick scabs? Ah, <laughs> I know. Which do you I know love what? doing. I'm sure everybody does. I do. And and everybody out there is going, I love to pick a scab. I tell you what we do as nurses and tissue biology nurses, we love to squeeze. We like to squeeze and we like to pick. Um, but um, the, the, the problem is, is because a scab forms over the top of a wound and it's not healed properly. So okay. if you leave a wound, you know, like a lot of older people say, oh, leave it open to the air and let it just dry out. So then you get a scab formation over the top. But then when that picks off, then you get that raw wound, don't you, appearing again and it bleeds. And um, so if a wound heals as it should do in a moist environment, then the wound contracts together the edges with those epithelial cells. And those studies were done in 1962 by a man called George Winter on pig skin. Winter's so we know pig. it's on the on the pig. So it's true evidence. We know that it's there. So that's why. So we don't want, you know, we don't want scabs forming and picking off of things like that. And we have to be careful because I know when I was a district nurse, we used to always get tweezers and for that hyperkeratosis and patients go, oh, just pick it off, pick it off. But then sometimes you can cause trauma with that as well. So this newer type of mechanical debridement is much better um, for the patient. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so just I've been uh, reading the comments, as I always do, and uh, listening uh, intently. Uh, there's just a couple that I just picked up on just because I thought it was really nice that what we've we've had, um, uh, I think our highest number yet. I think we've had over 750 really? people watching the, uh, oh, watching the presentation this evening, which is fantastic. So thank That's you really very nice. much to uh, to everyone that has joined yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed there were a couple of uh, there were a couple of nurses that have changed, uh, have uh, are moving from one role into another. So, oh, okay. so Helen, who is a, a, a formerly an ITU nurse, is now moving into uh, community ambulatory clinics, and she's finding these really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and there's Kayla, who I'm sure won't mind me saying her age because she put it in her comment. She's a 47 year old second year student doing a dissertation on foot ulcers that finds it oh really wow so, that's br brilliant yeah. it just shows doesn't it you can do anything at any i mean i was a i was a late to nursing i would say late i mean i was in my late 20s which kind of is a late for a lot of people but you can do anything at any age and we're all learning and we're all still you know doing courses and everything yeah. else so that's brilliant yeah well absolutely so good luck to everybody that's told us that they're either moving from one mm. uh, position into another where mm. they're going to be treating wounds or for people who are new to nursing so thank you very much for joining us um so debridement a couple of, we've got lots of questions um I, I i've got another one with regard to mechanical debridement um you mentioned around sort of uh, different people having different skill levels and things like that and i think that's a really important point um, but with regard to debridement, mechanicals, mechanical, I guess, seems as that's what we're talking about with regard to this product. But um, it, it, are all nurses able to debride? Is that is that allowed? Or do you have to have a certain qualification or be at a certain level? Can anyone do it? Um, no, so there's different levels of debridement that we said. So the autolytic debridement, which is a, a, applying particular dressings, and the mechanical debridement, um, anybody anybody can can do that. And if you have a pathway of care, a care plan for your patient, even your non-qualified nurses who are going in in between, you know, to do dressing changes and things like that, we have that in my trust. Then they can perform this too. 
Um, so that's a safe way of debridement. When we're talking about then getting onto sharp debridement and other things, you, you have to have a specialised course to do that. Um, so don't be getting scissors and things like that out and scalpels and stuff. But um, with the, like the, the pad that we showed and the dressings that we apply under the supervision of our qualified nurses who put the care pathway into place, that's absolutely fine. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so our first question then from the uh, from the viewers this evening is from Jane. And it is how often should mechanical debridement be carried out? OK, so um, hi, Jane. Um, so mechanical debridement, it's not not just a one off thing. So we're not going to see, you know, like we saw the pictures of those devitalized wound beds and slough. So we'll give it a good go. And then that's it. It's kind of a recurrent process. Um, so in my trust, we have it as part of our pathway of cleansing of wounds. And um, so we do it at every dressing change because, um, you know, biofilm will breed really, really easy within that moist environment. So we kind of, it's, it's almost like a prophylaxis pre preventative process as well. Uh, and when do you know that? When do you know that a wound doesn't need to be debrided, uh, debrided then? Because if we're talking about debriding, obviously, if it's necrotic tissue, it's very obvious that it needs to be removed uh, in, in most cases. But when, if it's, if you're talking slough, how do you, is it just a visual thing that you know that actually that doesn't need to be debrided, even if it looks like it's got maybe a small film over it? Yeah, it's not just visual. And the thing is with biofilm, you can't always see it. That's a problem. Sometimes, you you know, some people say it looks a bit shiny and things like that, but you can't. It's if the wound is static and not healing. So if you've got a wound and it's just stuck, you know, we do our measurements as part of our assessment and take take photographs and things and it's just like this is not moving or it becomes over granulated things like that um then you know that the, the possibility is that it, it's just got biofilm present so we need to continue then with that process once it starts to contract in and the edges and everything's going along all happy and as it should be um then we can just you know do cleansing with gauze or something like that but to be fair i use um you know um, mechanical debridement um more often than not really okay um so the second question is from jenny uh with reference to self-care what are your thoughts on a patient using a debridement pad as part of their management plan um so yeah um hi jenny um so absolutely you know i've, I've done a few videos and things around this and with there are lots of resources out there to access this type of thing um, you know, we are, I like to call it supported self care within wound care, supported management. Um, so we are creating care plans. We've done so, some for wounds that you would never even think of that a patient and their families could manage but but with um you know support from us and community nurses we've we've done that um so um absolutely i mean look at this i mean you know i just slip my hand in there and um you know it's a bit part of the somebody's washing their legs anyway you know when they've got dry skin hyperkeratosis and we're encouraging them to do that then they could you know we can like wax on wax off <laughs> they can do that with their with their own skincare regime so um it makes sense uh yeah i guess it, I, the, the key is making sure that you are that they're not overdoing it i guess isn't it i, I yeah. think um I, I guess that's the same with anything but um yeah i, I it's just them being careful and uh, good explanation as to how to do it always um, we've got another question could you tell us a bit more about your pathway? Um, so my particular pathway um, is it's around infection prevention and infection management. So it involves um, the obviously the assessment of, um, of a, a patient's wound. So the first line is if they and it follows that wound infection continuum. So there's no signs of clinical infection. But within that, we have a cleansing process. Um, of the wound so that involves a mechanical debridement right from the start with that and then I have particular products from from my pathway on there and these particular products are a bacteria binding so it's only a prophylaxis um, process so they will remove any biofilms and slough that are, are attempting to grow within that moist environment then it moves through to a colonized wound and then to a spreading infection and then to signs and symptoms of septis. So it, it really does follow that international infection continuum. So if anybody wants copies of that, 
and um, I'm sure in some way that we we should be able to share that with people. I don't know. Well, I think that um, just to make everyone aware, um, after this, this video not only will be available on our uh, on the Facebook page, but it'll also go on to our website, which is jcn.co.uk, yeah. along with copies of the presentation. And maybe there we can put uh, put a copy of your pathway on there for people to download. Yeah. If you're happy with people to have. Yeah, happy with that. Or just to, you know, an e explanation of, of particular things that we use. And it's always important, you know, I, I'm, I have particular... Um, dressings on you know on my pathways of various different things but you must always follow your what because your own in your own trust there'll be tissue viability nurses who will have formalized care pathways and things so it's really important to follow what they do and they will all be based you know in evidence-based care and practice so. okay um so we've done uh, quite a few questions uh, the next one when would you choose surgical debridement over mechanical so, I mean, well, there's there's mechanical, then it jumps, then you can do sharps debridement and then surgical debridement. So if, say if I had a person who got um, what we call a pre-tibial laceration, like, you know, a, a, a trauma room to the leg and they've got a massive hematoma, so big blood clots and things like that, I would want to refer them to have um, a surgical debridement. If I've got a, an extensive, massive pressure ulcer, um, that I feel would benefit from surgical debridement because it's quicker um, and, you know, it's going to reduce the infection. Somebody with a wound that, you know, is really necrotic, we still sometimes see necrotizing fasciitis. So that's a, a real risk to patients' health um, because of sepsis. So things like that, then a patient would be admitted for surgical debridement. Now, Sharps debridement, you have to have a specialised course within that. So a lot of diabetic teams will do that. And then they'll debride like necrosis on foot, on, on feet and things where, you know, normally in general practice would never attempt that. Um, I, I do go to patients where I'll debride with um, different forms of sharps, um, you know, slough and things like that. But we, we have to be careful um, in um, people's home settings sometimes um, doing that. If somebody's on warfarin, I wouldn't attempt it because, you know, they could have a massive bleed or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, and then the last question is, is mechanical debridement always done in the hospitals slash surgeries and not in the nursing home? Um, is mechanical debridement always done in the hospitals? And so Does that make sense? I think that probably should be the other way around. It um, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, well, to be fair, mechanical debridement can be done in any setting and it should be done in any setting. So, you know, in, a, in, an, in a, an acute ward, in a clinic setting, in a home, person's own home, residential home, nursing home, you know, this, this type of mechanical debridement is safe and easy to use. So, you know, with um, just some elements of training and uh, where it's indicated, we, you know, many of us as healthcare professionals can use it. There should be no barriers to it. Excellent. Um, well, that, that, that's our final question. I just want to um, thank you again for uh, this evening's session. I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us. Um, it's a special day today. Football is back. So the fact that we've oh, got no. 750 people, I don't know whether that is, I don't want to sound sexist, but do we have so many people watching because nurses are pre predominantly women? That's uh, am, very I digging, sexy, am I digging a hole and their husbands are all watching football? Maybe I'm digging a big hole. I, mean, I shouldn't have said that. <gasps> How dare um, you? But I'm going to go watch the football very shortly. But before I, uh, before I go, um, thank you, Essity, again for supporting this evening. Um, for any of you that are watching, if you are interested in learning uh, any more about uh, Deborah Clean, then there should be a, a slide on the screen with a concierge at email address where you can email them and find more information. Um, what I will say is if you do that, if you could use your, um, preferably if you could use your NHS um, email address. Um, and also, just as an aside, um, we've also launched, as well as our Wound Care Today brand, we've recently launched uh, a, a, another platform called Urology Continent Care Today. So if, if you aren't um, already following that on Facebook and Twitter, please do so. Um, ST and their uh, leading brand, Tenor, are also one of our partners on there. So please do go and explore uh, the Tenor Community Facebook page, which was just launched this week, because this week happens to be uh, World Continents Week. Um, we will be back in a few weeks' time. We're very much looking forward to uh, our next presentation. Alison, thank you again. It's always a 
pleasure. Um, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go and watch the football. I'm going to be perfectly honest. That's what I'm going to do. So, I'm not. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all, uh, all again soon. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Good night.